Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. Blake Cousins here. We've got a special report for you tonight. We're going to be speaking with people that do not exist in ufology, but were the groundbreakers in regards to the phenomenon. Some of the interviews you're going to hear tonight were the last interviews that you've heard from these people right here on Third Phase of Moon. Like Art Bell. We are lucky enough to get his UFO sighting right before he passed away, including the last interview with Edgar Mitchell, third mission to the moon, sixth man on the moon. And he gave us some insight in regards to his proximity to Area 51, along with the great man himself, Stanton T. Friedman. What he states years ago, right here on Third Phase of Moon, is relevant to this day. So buckle up, everybody, and enjoy this special right here with the legends on Third Phase of Moon. Listen up. Welcome back. Blake Cousins here at Third Phase of Moon. Wow, breaking news just in. We're going to be speaking to Art Bell. He's back live taking callers from around the world. The world is excited. We're here with Dr. J. Andy Elias, who's going to be introducing us from drjradiolive.com. Dr. J. Absolutely. The legend is back. The king of late night radio, the godfather of paranormal radio, listed as literally the top five most influential radio hosts of all time. The one and only Art Bell returning from retirement July 20th, everybody. When this is broadcasting this coming Monday that everybody will hear it, Monday the 20th. And we've already released the first guest. Art has already been speaking about it. President Kennedy Booster died. And the final liftoff of Discovery. They, they are not what they claim to be. And you are on the air. the legend himself, Mr. Art Bell. I hear, by the way, that Third Phase Moon puts a lot of stuff up, a lot of videos, a lot of pictures of UFOs, and lets people decide for themselves. And that's what I do, too. You know, I think that's the best way of going about this, uh, you know, phenomenon. Nobody could actually nail it right on the head and go, hey, this is what it is. You know, it's a, it's an unidentified flying object. Yeah, I think we, uh, you know, we're getting about 10 to 12 different UFO sightings on a daily basis. And you know what? NASA is pretty much the ones that, you know, keep it going. They're the ones that are making the mistakes by uh, putting the stuff out and then again trying to cover it up afterwards. That's what I find so funny. I'm really glad you mentioned NASA because there was a recent video, I'm sure you have seen it, I'm sure you probably got it posted, but it shows objects, as not, it was taken from the space station, and it shows objects leaving the atmosphere, no question about it, leaving the atmosphere and going into space, and then suddenly a NASA, a little NASA thing pops up and says, oh, uh, something went wrong with the video feed. <laughs> You know, it's funny you mention that because six times in the last year and a half, the cousins, the brothers, have actually uh, recorded NASA uh, ISS footage being filmed, UFO footage, and then they cut the feed within 24 to 48 hours. Twice they called me and asked me if I could screen capture it for them to make it. And sure enough, the moment they uploaded it, boom, the mainstream media cuts it out. Oh, there you go. Um, I've had my own sighting, uh, my unquestioned sighting. Something wow. for me, you know, at 150 feet, I felt like I could have thrown a rocket. And my, what, what, my wife and I were on the way home from Las Vegas, and my wife said, what the hell is that? You know, she could see it in the rearview mirror. And I pulled the car over, stopped about, oh, I don't know, maybe a uh, half mile from home, something like that. And we both got out of the car, looked up, and this gigantic triangular object floated directly above us directly above us and I felt like I could have thrown a rock at it I was in total shock this was before the days of you know easy quick pull the camera from your hip and take a, a photograph <laughs> sure. camera with me but um, the next week 
it turns out that a whole bunch of people in the uh, Pahrump Valley had seen this, and they called the Air Force Base. The newspaper called the Air Force Base, and the Air Force Base said, oh, yes, there may have been a secret mission that overflew the Pahrump Valley that night. It was a C-130 aircraft. <laughs> sure it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sure right. it was. A C-130 that's a flying saucer, that's right? right. Hey. Uh, you know, it would have rattled my teeth. This thing made no sound whatsoever. It was defying gravity. Absolutely. You know, uh, Art, it's uh, incredible to hear, you know, your uh, close encounter. You know, I think that's what's going to be happening. Once you go live on air, people are going to be sharing more and more what's going on. I think we're up to almost a quarter of a million subscribers now and 150 million views. And, you know, that's I think it's not us right here at Third Phase, the base that finds these UFOs. It's the world that have their eyes on. we got a quarter of a million UFO investigators out there. It's always uh, there's people out there on it. So I think when you come out, you're going to be feeling a lot of that. And I hope to get the word out to everybody that, you know, Art's back. <laughs> well, I hope you do. Uh, that's right. Midnight in the Desert and uh, the place to go to help us out and subscribe. Now, it's going to be a free show, folks. It's going to be free to everybody. But for five bucks a month, you know, they get uh, to download the show anytime they want. They get to send me messages while I'm on the air, all that sort of thing. So hopefully people will support us. And as I mentioned, five bucks a month at rfl.com. And let me let me throw this in too. Not only do you get the podcast, which is the same price and better than in other podcasts from other people, you also get the opportunity to actually ask Art questions directly. If it's a good question, you can ask it on ArtBell.com through the wormhole as a time traveler, and he will ask the question to the guest if you're a member. Uh, by, by way of a quick promo, let's see if uh, you recognize this voice. Want to take a ride? From the high desert and the great American Southwest, this is Midnight in the Desert. There you go, a little tea. <laughs> nice. <laughs> hey, you know, Art, uh, we're going to be continuously, the footage comes in almost on a daily basis. I know uh, you're going to be taking calls from around the world, but I'd sure like to uh, share sometimes when this breaking news video or information comes in. I sure would like to get your uh, feedback, and maybe your listeners might want to take a look at what's coming in right here at Third Phase. All right. Sure well, appreciate I've the got, collaboration. I've got a hotline number, which I won't give you right now, but uh, okay. I will give you, and so the answer to that is absolutely yes. You know, Art, you know, it's a pleasure right here at Third Phase Moon. Honorable uh, just speaking with you right here. And um, we're looking forward to uh, future collaboration. Good luck with your show, and uh, we'll be listening, standing by. Blake, Brett, and uh, Dr. J, thank you all very much, and it's coming. Stanton, thanks for joining us right here at Third Phase of Moon. It's my privilege. I may even find what Third Phase of the Moon looks like. <laughs> it means... <laughs> All right, Stan, let's get to it. You've been involved with this for over 54 years. What, in your opinion, is on the topic of the global cosmic Watergate and the hopeful disclosure? Do you think disclosure will ever happen? I think the only way it will happen is if somebody like uh, the equivalent of the New York Times or the Washington Post did what Woodward and Bernstein did to the political Watergate. In other words, devote the resources. It's real easy to blow the lid off this thing. Uh, six months would do it because the evidence is overwhelming that there's a cover-up and that there are aliens visiting and so forth. The question is, the problem is that we have a resistance on the part of the media. They, they think that, well, if this were true, they would know about it because it would be very important and they don't, so it must not be, and why waste any time or money? It did take money to get Watergate out in the open, as you recall. Uh, so I'm not an optimist, and also I better surprise you, or maybe not, by saying I don't think everything should be disclosed. Uh, I think there are national security matters here. I worked under security for 14 years. Why should the United States put data out on the table, maybe new technological data, if the Russians and Chinese and others don't also put out their data? That doesn't make sense to me. You never hand your potential enemies a new technology to use uh, in case they feel like it. So uh, I think we do need to recognize that a new era has begun for mankind. That is, <laughs> we're not the big shots on the block anymore. And some people don't like that. No government wants its people to think of themselves as earthlings. We're still in the nationalist era, you know. 
Uh, and so there are real barriers to it, but I certainly don't think everything ought to be dumped out on the table. I mean, black budgets are running, depending on who you believe, 30 to $50 billion a year. There's a lot going on. And some of that is legitimately classified. With the advent of cell phone technology and people having cameras readily available to them, we've been having mass sightings sent to us right here at Third Phase of Moon. Do you think there might be a reason for this? And are they preparing for invasion? I don't, you know, it, it's not easy to judge how much activity is going on. I've been checking my audiences around the world for years and years. And typically at the end of my lecture, of course, I would never ask at the beginning, 10% believe that they've seen a flying saucer. But when I ask how many of you reported it, typically it's only 10% of the 10%. And the biggest reason being they think I was some kind of a nut. So it's very hard to judge what's going on. I mean, MUFON is getting 600 plus cases a month. And yet I've had people just the other day, somebody said, well, how come we haven't had any sightings recently? There's plenty of sightings, you don't hear about them. And so if, if there's a bump in the curve and there's some good coverage uh, on the media, you may get other people willing to come forward. But until that happens, most of them sit back. So we don't have a very good picture at all of how much is happening all over the world. And I still get people saying, well, how come they're only seen in the United States? They're not. I've lectured in 18 other countries besides all 50 states and 10 Canadian provinces. And everywhere I go, people have seen UFOs. Very interesting. And it is very amazing what you're saying here. You know, you broke the Roswell case in the 1970s. And there are people and eyewitnesses coming forward to this day. Do you think there are cover-ups on the crash retrievals? And, uh, you know, what is your topic on the whole? Well, let's face it. Most of the original witnesses are dead. And if they come forward, that would be a truly remarkable event. <laughs> but... Uh... Uh, occasionally we get somebody new. We get somebody saying, oh, my uncle told me uh, he's getting old and he wants, you know, doesn't want to go to his grave keeping the secret. But uh, Roswell is still attracting big crowds at every festival, you know, early July. I'll be there this year as I was last year and the year before and so forth. Uh, and I use it as an example. Uh, the other day I gave a talk in uh, Texas. Uh, Laredo, Texas, and it had originally been canceled because the person in charge said, well, nobody's interested in this stuff, guys, so they canceled it. Then a good group of serious investigators down there came forward, and we had over 600 people the other day, and she was there, the one who had canceled it, and was astonished. You know, these people are all interested? Well, I will guarantee you they're all interested, and I have uh, had as many as 2,000 people to a lecture, so... Uh, don't tell me nobody's interested, and often the campus will tell me that's the biggest crowd we've had, you know, for an off-campus uh, speaker coming here. So the interest is there. The fear of ridicule is still there. And if they stress my professional background as a scientist, uh, you know, working for Westinghouse, GE, General Motors, etc., and on far-out classified, eventually canceled programs, that was my specialty, canceled programs, <laughs> nuclear airplanes, fission rockets, fusion rockets, that sort of thing. Uh, then they'll show up figuring, uh, well, GE and Westinghouse don't hire nuts, do they? Well, maybe they do. I don't know. <laughs> In other words, the, this laughter curtain is real. And it takes a lot of effort to lift that, to get people to speak up and think up. And especially the ancient academics and fossilized physicists who think that the only place research gets done is in academia, right? Wrong. Uh, and just to give you an example, when I was working on nuclear airplanes a long time ago, in 1958, for General Electric, our budget that year was $100 million. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. That was a lot of money for 1958, you know? And we're not talking three professors and 20 grad students. We're talking... 3,500 people with 1,100 engineers and scientists. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we didn't build a nuclear-powered airplane. We learned a lot about all kinds of technology. So you need to be very careful in making any kind of conclusions about this phenomenon because you don't know what's going on underneath the surface. You know, that makes perfect sense, Stanton. 
you know, it's speculated. The reason for disclosure, and it no longer needs to be legal, is because, you know, all the technologies in private companies. What do you think of this, and how do you think this could be resolved? Well, I think it's wrong on two counts. Uh, who cares what anybody speculates about this? You can throw darts at a dartboard with yes, no, maybe on it, you know. Uh, I think most of the big research projects were done by private companies under government contract, not on their own. That aircraft nuclear propulsion program was sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission and the United States Air Force. It was done by General Electric, Pratt Whitney, also Convair Fort Worth, but Uncle Sam uh, owned the store, so to speak. So I, I don't think so. And I would hope, as a matter of fact, that technology developed with government funding should make its way out when it doesn't violate security to do so. Uh, for example, suppose we figured out a new way to detect aircraft moving in the atmosphere. Should we really be putting that out on the table? I don't think so. You don't want your enemies to have that data. So it isn't just a question of greed on the part of industry. And, and I know from my, I, I've spoken at over 600 colleges, and I know some of the academics look down their nose at industry. I've had two different people tell me that if Roswell really happened, Stan, they'd have had to pull half the physicists out of the colleges in the country to deal with that. And I just laugh. That's absurd. Los Alamos was employing 7,000 people at that time. There are a whole bunch of other major laboratories with very competent people who had security clearances, who were readily available to have materials sent to them and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it's false reasoning and based on no evidence whatsoever. You wrote this book a few years back, Captured, about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction that fascinated me when I was a child. What's your take on the abduction phenomenon and is there an alien agenda? Yeah, uh, most of the work on the book was done by Kathleen Marden, Betty's niece. My name is first because the publisher said it'll sell more, Stan. What do you say to a publisher when he tells you that? You don't say, well, we don't want it to sell. You can hardly do that. Uh, I think uh, that's an outstanding case primarily because of Dr. Benjamin Simon. Not just because the Hills were, were respectable people. And they certainly didn't intend to get any publicity for it. That was uh, somebody violating uh, confidence. But Dr. Simon was a world-class expert on treating what today we would call post-traumatic stress disorder. He ran a hospital with 3,000 beds for war veterans coming back from the Second World War. You know, your buddy's head gets blown off next to you. It's a little hard to integrate that into your life. And he didn't know anything about flying saucers, but he knew a lot about getting people to relive experiences to find out what happened when there's missing time. You know, the guy with his buddy's head blown off has blocked it out. But if you integrate it properly and so forth, uh, you can find out what happened. And Dr. Simon was the star of an army movie, uh, Let There Be Light, uh, showing how he worked with war veterans. And they're still coming back from war with PTSD. It was shell shock war veterans was the expression back then, but, uh, you know, PTSD sounds so much more sophisticated. Anyway, he has said in writing, he's dead now, so we can't say it vocally, that uh, the emotional intensity for Betty and Barney, they, these were separate sessions now, they each had about 10, was so intense that it matched that of the, the war veterans that he'd worked with. He had, he had to stop one session each because he felt they wasn't sure they could handle it. The emotional intensity was so great. So yes, earthlings are being abducted by aliens. And many people find that objectionable because nobody has their permission. And there are many people claiming abductions who haven't been abducted. And you don't just run off and find you a nice parlor hypnotist to say, oh, I'll, I'll find out what happened. It's got to be done properly, carefully, Matter of fact, Kathleen is working on uh, a new book about alien abductions, uh, and I'm, I, I've read most of it, not quite all of it yet. So I think aliens are abducting. Now, why they're doing it, they're obviously trying to get information, judging by the tests they seem to run, about Earthlings. But whether it's a class project, I mean, when I was a kid in high school, I cut up a frog. It wasn't because I was intrinsically interested in frogs. And there were 
millions of kids who cut up frogs to find out a little about anatomy. So it's really hard to judge what's really going on. Is this a thesis project? You know, who knows? Maybe they're looking for earthlings to grab to steal a certain kind of genetic material from. I don't know. Now, you could be a, a noisy negativist and say, Stan, they're going to clobber us, and they're just getting all the data before they do that. You know, like the turkeys on November 15th undoubtedly think that they're being well taken care of. Look, they get all the food they can eat, more than they can eat. You get water. They're kept warm when it's cold outside. Obviously, nice guys. And then it's Thanksgiving. Too bad. So what I'm saying is you need to be really careful about jumping to conclusions about these things. And uh, it is important that people be helped, but not in ways that are going to create problems for them. Uh, neither Kathleen nor I believe one should immediately rush to a friendly hypnotist. There's more to the story than that. Now, do you think the U.S. is still controlling and imposing the global cover-up of other governments? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. I think there is cooperation and money talks uh, there was a case down in Brazil, the Vargina case, and I happened to be down there when news, uh, it, it hit the headlines. And there were stories that apparently the U.S. came along and offered enough money to gra grab the wreckage and what was left. Uh, and I don't know. I, I think, remember, all governments have a common interest, surprising as it may sound, in not telling us what's going on. The six reasons I give for the cover-up apply to all governments. First, you want to figure out how the darn things work. They make wonderful weapons delivery and defense systems, uh, outmaneuver anything we got. So uh, the world budget right now for things military this year is a trillion dollars. So that's an important consideration for most governments. The second problem is you don't want the other guy to know that you know that he knows. What if he figures out how they work before you do? You know, it's the old weapon, weapon, counter weapon, uh, bigger spears, stronger shields, that sort of thing. So you can't tell anybody because uh, you don't want them to know what you know, and you don't want to tell anybody what you know because you don't want them to know that. Uh, the third problem is, if you were to make an announcement, what would happen? You know, say the Queen and the Pope, my two favorite, highly trusted people around the world, about the same age, <laughs> All you can say. What if they were to say, indeed, the word is that uh, Earth is being visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft? What would happen? Mental hospital admissions would go up. Stock market would go down. That's never good for many people. And there'd be an immediate push, I think, on the part of the younger generation for a new view of ourselves, instead of as Americans, Canadians, Greeks, Peruvians, whatever, as Earthlings. I mean, from an alien viewpoint, we are all Earthlings. We don't seem to like that very much, if you notice. Uh, no government wants that. Nobody in power wants to give up power. There is a fourth problem. Uh, Pat Robertson has loudly proclaimed that we are the only intelligent life in the universe, which I find a very strange notion, uh, and that all this UFO stuff is the work of the devil. I haven't seen any signs of that either, but he'd be up the creek without a religious paddle if we were told the truth. Uh, there's another peculiar one goes back to something you asked earlier. People say, look, Stan, if they're coming here and we're not going there, they're obviously ahead of us. Uh, that means that soon there'll be new methods of energy production. There goes the oil companies, new methods of ground and air transport. There goes those companies, economic chaos. And I say, yeah, there'd be, there's always chaos when there's progress. But, you know, there aren't many buggy whip manufacturers anymore. And we, we've survived that. Uh, the last reason for the cover, I think, is that I have on seven different occasions been told of situations in which aircraft went up, military aircraft went up to chase UFOs and didn't come back. And nobody's been told about that. Uh, and if I've heard of seven instances, there's going to be a heck of a lot more than that. And these are people not seeking publicity. Uh, it, I told to one guy who was sent up, and he did come back because his guns weren't loaded. He tried to shoot the thing down. People forget that in 1952, there were orders given to military pilots, shoot them down if they don't land when instructed to do so. 
That sounds a little silly. How do you tell an alien, get your craft the heck on the ground, you know, so we can look at it? That doesn't sound very reasonable. So those reasons are enough for to keep most countries away from doing anything that would change the balance of power. That's what's happening in the world. While I got you here, do you have any classified information you want to share with our viewers in regards to UFOs right here on Third Phase of Moon? If, if I had classified information at this late date, I certainly had plenty of it when I worked in industry. I wouldn't have shared it then, and if I had it now, I wouldn't share it either. But, and I think that's why some people talk to me. They trust me enough. Uh, I had a guy call me and say, how come you're still alive? I said, what do you mean? Well, you're saying the government's lying and covering up? And I said, yes, but anybody who listens to me know that I don't want everything out, out on the table, and I may be doing exactly what they want, getting them ready, getting the public ready for when the big disclosure comes. But think about it. What happens when we admit that people have been abducted and the citizens say, can't you protect me? That's a sticky wicket when you get down to it, you know. <laughs> You know, Stanton, I have to ask, have you ever seen a UFO for yourself with your own eyes? No, I never have. I, uh, Kathleen and I were being interviewed <laughs> for television talking about the Hill case out in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire at night, dark. And suddenly the cameraman of all people says, hey, what's that over your heads? Why? We, so we, you never have that happen to you. I've been interviewed a load of times, never have anybody, the cameraman, you know, interrupt the process. We look up behind us. There were some points of light in the sky, one after the other, left to right. I don't know what the heck it was. We later figured they were filming this <laughs> with our backs, <laughs> the objects up there. We later found out other people at the place where we were staying had uh, also seen UFOs that day. We think, think not sure, uh, that it was a uh, National Guard group dropping battlefield flares. Uh, and we don't know, but that seemed a decent explanation under the circumstances. That's as close as I've come. Unfortunately, I cannot say by personal experience, those aliens were nice guys. <laughs> I saw that saucer move. No, no such luck. If other countries from around the world started to disclose information in regards to UFOs, do you think it'd put the pressure on the U.S. government to reveal some truth? No, I think it would put pressure on the government to get those other countries off their back. Uh, I think the United States has, and remember, Russia feels the same way, I'm sure, and so do the Chinese. Uh, you know, it's not just the U.S. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure one of the reactions to Roswell was who are these guys working with? They're little guys on board. Maybe they're working with the Chinese. They're little guys. You know, you don't know when you don't know, you've got to be careful. And there are more of them than there are of us, let's face it. <laughs> so you'd like to know who's talking to who about what, where, and when. And we don't. You know, Staten, we're getting a lot of information from you, and I really appreciate you being with us, and it's amazing. I want to ask you about President Obama being elected again for President of the United States. Do you think he's privy to some of the secret information in regards to UFOs, or who really is in charge of the government? That's a difficult question, because there is a certain amount of safety for any classified activity if the president doesn't have the details, because he has asked so many questions so many times. He talks to the press all the time. And what he doesn't know can hurt you. In other words, the plausible deniability. Well, I didn't know about that. The one president I think did know something was the first George Bush because he had been director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And as, as that, he certainly knew something. But I don't think he was telling his son or anybody else. You know, that's, I worked under security for 14 years. People say all these guys would have told their wives. Forget it. I never told my wife anything classified. I'd be crazy to do that. You know, so who knows? But you don't want the president to know too much. Uh, you might tell him, uh, you know, you don't have a need to know for that, Mr. President. I'm sorry, but it's a vital matter. Stanton, have you ever actually seen in person or on film, or better yet, actually held an artifact that came from a UFO crash? 
I've never seen an artifact from a crash. I've seen physical effects produced by saucers near the ground as one of the 4,000 physical trace cases that Ted Phillips has investigated. After you read the first 200, it's commonplace. They're seen near the ground, and when they leave, you find physical changes in the ground, but you don't find pieces of the crash. You are often referred as the godfather of UFOlogy, and rightfully so. You know, assuming disclosure continues to elude us, what direction would you like UFOlogy to go, and what about your legacy? I'd like to see uh, more serious attention being given at universities, more courses being taught. There have been some. There have been a dozen PhD theses. That's not enough. There's plenty of work to keep a lot of people busy. And I'd like to see people start thinking in terms of what's the, the universe outside of the Earth like? And the notion that the, there are people who are never in contact with other beings from other planets because you can't get here from there, which is so much hogwash. Uh, we need to think, what does it mean if we're able to become part of a galactic federation? And, you know, that's the thing about the Betty and Barney Hill case. The base stars, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, constellation of reticulum, got to go below the equator to see it. They're only 39.3 light years away. but from each other. They're only an eighth of a light year apart. They're next door neighbors. And they're also a billion years older than the sun. So can you imagine what their technology might be and how much more incentive they would have for interstellar travel than it is for us? Because we're out in the boonies, nobody next door. Uh, for them, incidentally, you can see people on planets around one looking over at the other you can see it all day long all night long and the important thing the other one that changes your picture of what's going on and so I think we need to start growing up to the notion of connectedness of us not being at the top of the heap I mean Copernicus was wrong so was Ptolemy uh, what we realize we're not the big shots we'd like to think we are too bad, maybe we can learn something from that. Now for part two, the exclusive interview with astronaut Edgar Mitchell in regards to what he has to say about Area 51 and a message for third phase of moon. Now let's get to the exclusive interview with Dr. Danny Elias and myself asking Edgar Mitchell the questions. Apparently there was a ex-CIA agent that just came out with a deathbed confession that he worked with Eisenhower to find out what was going on in Area 51. Have you ever been in Area 51? Any knowledge of Area 51 at the time while you were working with NASA? Well, I know, I know of it, but I don't. It's, only, it's very sketchy. I do not know it in detail. Uh, but uh, and I've flown over it many times when I was still in the Navy. But uh, uh, the uh, it's been, it has been the site for many years of um, of the UFO activity and perhaps the attempt to the attempt to uh, uh, find out our own uh, develop our own activities into that. Now, I am not. I cannot say that I'm intimately familiar with Area 51 at all, but I've known some of the people that served there and uh, some of the, and. Uh, for example, Bob Lazar, I knew him quite well when he decided to reveal what he knew. Um, but besides that, I don't, I don't, I'm not well, well informed on that. Doctor, we mentioned, of course, the, the citizen hearing, how you testified it. We've spoken to several of the witnesses and, of course, the organizer, Stephen Bassett. And what Blake was just referring to that gentleman with the CIA was also one of the testimonies that they heard. During that five days, you had the six retired congressmen and senators who came in there, uh, open minds but skeptics. At the end, all were convinced, and Senator Gravel has come forward now and says, this happened, there is a cover-up, and we are being engaged by an extraterrestrial race. And that's in a, basically in a court of law. If you had such testimony of such evidence, this would win over, even if you had a criminal law case with such a higher burden of proof. What do you think the importance of having such a hearing is, and do you think that this will actually lead us to something more important, such as a UN meeting on this? 
Of course, I think so. I know Steve Bassett well, and I did speak remotely through Skype at that, that conference, and I've talked with Bassett on many occasions. And yes, we're heading in that direction. Let me point out, our planet is not going to survive forever, neither is our sun. Uh, we're going to have to, in due course, be out of here, and we're not on a sustainable path right now. So we have to get our act together if we're going to continue living on this planet. And that means we have to emulate the ETs and be able to go somewhere else. And developing the uh, energy sources to do that and the technologies to do that is what it's really all about these days. And that's what I am involved in as much as I can be, is doing the research and the science to help us uncover how to do that. Wow, uh, absolutely fantastic. Do you think that our U.S. government is knowingly hiding secret information in regards to aliens, down craft? Do they have in their possession a flying saucer and alien beings? Well, I go back to the so-called Magic 12 organization. That's what it was purpose was to hold that information and to keep it under control. And there's many, many stories of how very knowledgeable people uh, and very high-level people were denied access to this information uh, along the road, including Barry Goldwater when he ran for president, um, and President Clinton's emissary who was sent to Wright Patterson and couldn't get any information about it. Uh, there, there is a, a long history here of uh, the, I'll just call it a cabal because that's just the word that's used, that has control of this information, has kept everybody from knowing what they don't want them to know, and that is kind of around the world. However, most money countries, including Britain and Belgium and France and uh, uh, Brazil and Mexico, have proceeded to open up their books completely. As far as I know, our country has not. You know, Dr. Mitchell, you mentioned that the this Majestic 12, it was created by uh, I believe Truman, and for basically the cover-up is in essence is what, as Stanton Friedman calls it, the cosmic water gates, uh, the truth embargo, as Stephen Bassett calls it. For the, through the Freedom of Information Act, there have been CIA documents going back to the 60s that actually admit to them ridiculing witnesses, uh, t covering, up, making a, uh, a cover-up or a story of with a sighting to either discredit the witness or to say it was swamp gas or something like that. And these documents are now surfacing publicly and proving to people that obviously they knew something of it of this of this happening. What what else do you know of them of, of this cover up and um, with regards to no more than what I've just said. Gotcha. Well, um, actually go ahead Blake. Well, I know Edgar Mitchell has, he's a real busy man, and we really appreciate you coming on Third Phase of Moon and sharing your experiences and telling your stories and your knowledge about what's going on, your mission, absolutely incredible. Mr. Edgar Mitchell, astronaut, third mission to the moon, sixth man to set foot on the moon, absolutely fantastic. Thanks for joining us here at Third Phase of Moon. Any last words? You bet. It's been a pleasure. Well, Bye. Dr. Mitchell, I do want to plug in. Your, you have written to our good third phase of moon friend, Roger Lear. You have written a preface in his book, which will be coming shortly. And if you can give one final message to all the viewers of third phase of moon, everybody out there listening, uh, what they can do to, to, to help disclosure. Well, I think uh, I'm much disclosure will take care of itself in due course. What I'm trying to get to our people uh, more importantly, is let's try to make this a sustainable civilization so we don't use up all of our uh, renewable resources and burn up our planet before uh, we need to. Let's try to keep it going for at least a few more centuries, which doesn't look like we're doing right now. Let me ask you this. You know, it's been over 40 years since we've been to the moon. Obama says we're going to be going back. NASA's working on it. It's still taking a while. Would you ever consider if, you know, it gets easier to go to the moon to ever to go back and visit it again? <laughs> well, there's a, this is a little side story uh, that uh, kind of goes around with an amusing little anecdote. Uh, you remember when John Glenn went back into space after he'd 
had his early flight, and he'd been a senator, and he'd been very prominent, and he went back into space at 77 years old. Now, I was only about 65 at that time. Mr. John and all those guys, the early guys, were just a few years older than me. However, I, we, we sat on some boards together up at the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, and one day over lunch a few years ago, I uh, had lunch with John at the same table. I said, John, there's a little story about it that you haven't heard, and I'll tell you. I said, when you went back into space, people started asking me, well, Edgar, don't you want to go back into space? And I said, well, of course, but I'm going to wait till I'm 100. John was only 77. Wait till I'm 100. Beat John's record. <laughs> that was a little humorous uh, remark about all that many, many years. Wow, uh, we'd still look forward to seeing you explore the frontiers out there. Absolutely amazing, John. Yes, you know, there was a there's a law, a federal law that prohibits extraterrestrial contact, and I believe it was created by NASA. And the penalties could range as high as either a five to ten year imprisonment plus a ten thousand dollar fine. And there's also a, a, a staffer, a NASA staffer, that came out and said that she, her job is to airbrush photos of the moon, Mars, and other planetary bodies, bodies taken by NASA and air out, airbrush out things like pyramids or other structures. What do you say with regards to the law? I mean, if, if they say there's no I'm contact. Not, I'm not familiar with any of that, so I can't answer your question. Certainly. What did you experience when you arrived on the moon what what did it feel like just tell us some of the detail in uh, your way of what it's like to be on the moon oh, sure. well let, let me point out that uh, we had practiced and practiced and practiced there wasn't anything really unfamiliar to us that we hadn't done a hundred times or more in the training areas at cape kennedy so and being well qualified test pilots and uh, all of us military pilots during at least either World War II, the Korean War, and then even later into the Vietnam, but Vietnamese War, uh, we were all pretty well qualified pilots. So going to the moon was just, it, well, I won't say it's a routine chore, but we tried to make it that by being so well prepared that nothing was really new, or, but it was new and exciting, except we were so well prepared that uh, we went through the task uh, one by one by one like we've been doing them all our lives. And uh, uh, so, yes, it was exciting. We enjoyed it. We did a good job. But we certainly were well prepared because that's what we trained on for a year or so before the flight. Coming back from the moon and then with all your experience and now all your studies into the phenomenon of possible extraterrestrial existence, what would you have to say to our third phase of moon viewers about, you know, possible finally disclosure that we are not alone in the universe do you think it'll ever happen of course sure it, it's it will happen because we're not alone in the universe and the the folks and they are uh, very high level folks not just in our country but everywhere i think there's it's called a cabal that of, of um, civilian people and perhaps governments that have tried very hard to keep this from becoming talking point among the people, but it's coming, becoming that anyhow, uh, because the knowledge is out, uh, well-educated people are accepting the fact, uh, the evidence, I don't want to say the fact, the evidence that says we've been visited, and I think some of the, the strongest evidence is that our missile silos that uh, carried intercontinental missiles over the years between the 40s and the 60s were routinely visited by uh, alien spacecraft and the missiles disarmed and most people know that uh, they were they were doing a great deal of effort to keep us from killing ourselves and each other uh, at that level Do gordon cooper was a, a very big person who spoke about this he even wrote a letter to the united nations and god bless his soul he passed away and i bet if he were here today he would have also testified at the citizen hearing as yourself did with i know he would because gordon and i served on apollo 10 together i knew him very very well and uh, yes we, we we would agree on these points
He saw a few objects once on Edwards Air Force Base when he was yeah, filming. Well, he was he was a duty officer out at Edwards and, and the UFO landed at uh, out there. He got pictures of it, sent it off to Washington, and he never was... heard about it again. If the crash retrievals are true, then all bets are off. It's very hard for people to get their minds around where the real power is. And it's not at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The reality is something much more stark. They've been working on this for 60, 70, perhaps 80 years. The reason why the government is talking about these UFOs now, they're getting ready for the next level of war. Are these objects a national security concern? They're proffering a narrative of a national security threat that doesn't exist. I call them alien reproduction vehicles. They're made by private corporations somewhere on this planet. Technology from Roswell from 1947 has largely been held back from us. Portal technology, teleportation, whatever you can imagine, it's already been done. The biggest secrets are not the zero point energy and electric robotics. It's the science of consciousness. All their communication systems are moving through the consciousness field and are thought actuated. The people of the CIA call it WSFM, weird science and frickin' magic. The transdimensional interstellar technology will benefit humanity. That has been tremendous disinformation. The media is keeping secrets with the government. These are lethal, vicious people. And I'm focused on exposing the extraordinary technologies that they would want to keep secret. No aspect of life on Earth will be unaffected by it.